All right, so let's get started here. All right, again, this is another Open NSM meeting, a weekly uh, network security monitoring group, where we talk about uh, network security monitoring, forensics, incident response, and other related things. Um, first things first, so the group updates. We have, uh, or we're looking for sponsors right now. I talked to ACM, and, it's, and um, it seems like we can get those. So if any companies are interested or uh, persons are interested in donating hardware, software, or uh, anything that could be of use to us, including monetary donations that we could apply for um, hardware or software, let us know. Um, we could actually uh, review the products and place them on our website and talk them about our talk about um, our review them in our meetings, as well as you can might be depending on how much you donate, you might be able to get a banner on the ACM website and access to the resume book. So we'll go right into the meeting sections. So it's been a busy week for me. I was out of town on vacation in Chicago, so we don't have a whole lot here, but uh, there was the ghost vulnerability, and there's uh, two links there, including the CVE, that you can find more uh, information about it. And it was a vulnerability in the GNU uh, Lib, uh, LibC library, LibC. Um, there was a function in the older deprecated uh, host, get host by name function that has been superseded by uh, the get address info, I think, um, that which allows you to use IPv6. So this is an older one that does not allow you to use that. And, there, and there's a helper function included with that function. Once that function is called, it calls like underscore underscore NSS underscore hostname something, and that um, was subject to a potential overflow attack. So um, in this particular case, a user would have to have a be able to supply the a string to that function, so it, it must be in cases where the application takes arguments to do a resol name resolution, and then potentially you could uh, overflow that. Um, a lot of quick course, a lot of numbers, a number of systems or or popular pieces of software are vulnerable to, including uh, OpenSSH. But in those cases, you're not actually passing those strings directly, so there's not a whole lot to worry about. Um, also. Um, Suricata 2.1 uh, Beta 3 was released, and it has a Modbus protocol analyzer, so you can do SCADA stuff with that if you would like. Um, that summarizes the NSM in the news section, so now we're going to go to the challenge quarter. So there was the SANS holiday uh, hacking challenge that happens every year and put on by Ed Scotus and a few others, and Josh Wright's one of them. And um, it gives you a scenario and uh, a storyline that has a bunch of clues in it that you can then, um, you could read and get a little more detail about the, the scenario. And then we can go from there. They provide a number of files right on the very bottom here, right here. And IP addresses that you can use to actually solve the problems. And this one, they give you a website and tell you can access port 80 and port 43. They also give you a USB file system image. And then the idea here is that you solve all the challenges you write a report on and you return it to them and then there's prizes available for people that solve them all, and then also based on, well, they have, they have the criteria right there, best overall answer, best technical, uh, most creative, et cetera. So uh, my boss, Warren Raquel, actually uh, sent us his, his, what he did to solve some of the solutions, and we're going to pull that out in just a moment here. So um, if you want to if you want to take a look at it, it's in our repository, open nsm meetings on GitHub. And I'm going to go ahead and unzip the uh, holiday challenge here. And then we're going to go into the report directory. And we're going to open up, we're going to begin with engagement1.html. And let's increase the size here. So this is a pen test example. And so they were given a, a system, this IP address, and they said, hey, what is the secret on this system? Well. So you have to figure out what's available in the system first, so you just do some reconnaissance. In this particular case, um, Warren Bus and that, and to scan the system for ports that were open, he found that there was two here, this strange one, 31124, and SSH. And he said that the SSH did not return anything that was obvious uh, to use to exploit the system, so he went with 31124, which is a good idea. And it turns out that this was some um, linguistics uh, or natural processing lang uh, programming language uh, uh, demon listening. And uh, he's kind of interactive. He says, hey, I am Elisa. What's on your mind? And uh, he typed in secret, and it gave him some information. He tried to begin, and eventually 
he typed a visit in a URL. This particular URL is probably his URL to his service, and then actually the actual demon actually connected to that server, so he was able to verify it using his logs, his, his uh, HTTPD logs. And he found some Mozilla five user agent string with this, and the actual secret was in this text right here, a quote by Alan Turing. And that's how we solved that problem. So let's go on. So he said he had to play around with it and see how the, well, yeah, the program him, responded. What made him think to do that? I don't know. Uh, it's probably something with the uh, the actual story outline. It probably gave you clues in there. So I imagine that. I haven't read that, but we're just kind of going over at a high level what he did. The second one was another pen test engagement. <coughs> and in this one, he was given the domain uh, scroogeandmarley.com and the port. So in the, in, the, in the actual outline, it said, hey, you can connect to this in 18443. He used it to obtain the certificate using the OpenSSL's client program. And he, he noticed that there was really nothing interesting in here. So what he then did next was that he tried um, Parkly, since that was something recent, so there's a good chance they put that in there. So he used, he grabbed the tool found on GitHub, just, and he goes a few of proof of concept tools out there. And um, he tried this one, and it actually looks like it was able to pull out data from memory that the SSL library was located. So um, in this particular case, he saw the actual secret here, website, and then the, uh, the, the uh, our URL encoded 20% for uh, a space, etc. And he used that, which he decodes it right here, and that was the next challenge answer. Then uh, on the website, he spidered it and found that there was some PNGs and MP3s. He opened up the MP3 in Adobe Audition and was looking for some, something interesting, maybe something hidden, hidden, but did not find anything. And as well, he uh, used EXIF tool on the PNGs looking for other useful information and did not find anything. So then what happened was he noticed that using a burp suite, the splattering uh, tool, a burp suite, to, that there was a CG, in the CGI bin directory, there was a submit.sh file. So uh, from that, he turned on the proxy intercept uh, tool to actually be able to communicate directly with the server and filled out in the header, um, in the user agent string of the header, a uh, the bash shell shock of vulnerability example uh, to exploit. And then he found, so we did that, he tried that, and then of course that's, he's not going to really see anything with that, but what he did next was use that to uh, talk to his server. So he used um, bash's method of using sockets, which is using a pseudo device called dev tcp, and actually text in there to one of his servers and then check on his server to see if there was a response. Um, and it turns out there was. So in that particular case, it was vulnerable to shell shock. And then, let's see what else did he do? So he, he used that same vulnerability to actually get a uh, reverse shell from Bash, right? Just using the uh, redirection of file descriptors. And uh, um, from there, he was able to look around. He did not find any common commands. Like ls wasn't there, cat wasn't there. Like most of the bin tools were not there. But the sh it was a bash shell, so he was able to use built-ins like cd and echo. And then uh, he, he used this command in particular to actually see what was in the file secret, which he which he noticed when, while playing around. You can see that the root of the disk, the file system here, he used echo star to list everything. And it turns out that there was a secret file here. And it turns out that secret file, when open, yields website secret two, use for skills for good, or use your skills for good, and that was the actual solution for that example. And then finally, the last one was a forensics engagement. And this particular one, there was a USB file system disk image that they had that you could play with, that you could uh, uh, analyze. And um, so he, he used uh, tools of the sleuth kit, FLS, which allows you to look at, uh, use a uh, common fossil to uh, navigate through the file system like LS and stuff. Um, he used that to actually view the files in the file system. So here he is using FLS and on the actual image, listing the files there. And, and up here he talks about how he found a number of programs like a, uh, like a, like a document, and here's a letter from Jack to Chuck Doc, and there is a secret text property, property in that one, so he got a few secrets there. But to go back into the actual analysis, then he used ICAT, which allows you to view the contents of a file based on their inode. And in that particular case, he, he was able to use these the inodes to actually get the resulting files from it. And then he examined each one in detail. Here's the letter from Jack to Chuck, and he found that using strings, the USB secret was listed in there. And then again, there was a PCAT NG file, and in this particular one, he used T-Shark 
to actually grab the, and so T-Circ and the expert info, it actually has uh, some stuff that aren't in the packet. Well, actually, in this particular case, I guess it's in, in the PCAP NG format because it can store these, but it uh, allows you to view a comment. So in this particular case, someone added a comment to the frame section, and he was able to use uh, the option of the T-Circ just to print those. So dash E frame number right here on the left, on the left and dot, dot comment. So that you can actually see the comments that were added to the PCAP NG file for a particular frame. And then inside that comment, there was uh, a USB RA secret as well, and that's how we solved that one. And wrapping up here, there was a encrypted zip file, and he threw it against John the Ripper and password recovery, recovery toolkit from Access Data, and, he, and uh, he, got, he actually got the password, which was shambolic, using the Access Data tool. And so, um, that actually resulted in a bad curtain.png file. And he said running XF tool against that file yielded this particular secret. And finally, um, there was a JavaScript program and he hidden inside the JPEG and he would use this Java tool to uh, pull it out. And the resulting secret which was in that report was Tiny Tim has died and then USB secret number four. So he, he achieved that one as well. All right, that summarizes uh, the challenge quarter. If you want to look at those in more detail, they are in the repository. And you can just go here, github.com, just open NSM meetings, and then you would go to 0202 2015, and it's in that directory, and you can download it. And for at this point, uh, we don't have anything else for these three sessions. We're going to hand it over to Shane, and Shane is going to talk about his... I'm going to need a minute. Okay, Shane needs just a moment here. We'll let him do that. Okay. Bumped up the he's been playing around with Scapey a little bit and just kind of want to share uh, what he's been working on. Yeah, I just got bumped off the network, so... Uh, Not a problem. Yeah, he got bumped off the network, so uh, just get a moment. Well, in the meantime, if anybody has any um, ideas or future talks or would like to give a presentation themselves, or even not even a presentation, we just simply just show us a new tool, some command line options, show us your research or interest or research that you've read about. If you've, if you've read an academic paper and you think it's interesting, it fits with this group and would like to talk about it in five to ten minutes, that's great. Just let us know. We're willing to accept anything. And this group really derives upon a user contribution. So the more that people contribute, the more information we'll have for everybody to learn from. And then finally, um, after Shane's talk, we'll have a talk that I'll be doing on using uh, uh, RSIS log in a uh, logging infrastructure setting. And these videos are all recorded and placed online. So we have a YouTube account and we have a Vimeo account, and I will upload those tonight probably, or depending on how much time I have. Okay, I need you to release the screen, I think. Okay, let me see here. Um, Also, if anybody has any questions, you can uh, unmute yourself. But once you ask the question, do mute yourself again. You can do this while we while we're presenting. So feel free to chime in. Okay. Let me move this up. Everybody, see this? So everybody can see the starting CAP page. Okay, so uh, like John was saying, I've really just been kind of playing around with this a little bit. So this is not uh, 
quite up to the the John Ship level of, of depth <laughs> when it comes to exploring a tool, but uh, I thought it was kind of neat. There's some fun stuff to do here, and I kind of just threw together a little parser for an extra credit project for one of my classes. Um, somebody had pointed me in this direction. What the assignment was just to to parse through a PCAP and pull out all the um, the TCP traffic, and so. Um, I did some Googling and found this Scapy, which is basically just a library of Python, and it's pretty easy to get it installed. Um, there's some stuff online, plenty of places online that will help you do that. Uh, and it can either be run, as they're showing here, as, uh, as a command line interface, or you can, you can put together scripts pretty much in the same way that you can with Python. So um, this is kind of a cool little t tutorial. I'm not going to actually type it out and go through, but but this just shows that with Scapy you can actually just uh, build a packet by hand like that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can also just stack layers like this. I haven't messed with that too much. Um, reading PCAP files, this is where mm, I came in, and it, it's pretty simple. As long as the uh, you point to the PCAP file, and you can just store it into a variable. And then um, something I thought neat was neat. I haven't messed with this either yet, though. But uh, you can you can pull that the packet apart, and it will create a bunch of these PDFs or PNGs files that just take the packet and highlight everything, which is I think a really cool learning tool for, okay, this is the actual data that's in this packet, and this is how this gets broken down, and this is, it gives a real graphical look at just a, a package is taken apart and shows you what every little bit means and and where and where to look for, you know, what version it is or what the protocol is or anything like that that you want to know, the destination port, the source port, anything like that, or the source Mac, anything like that, you're going to find. Um, in, in which part of the part of the packet that exists in. And here uh, we find some more uh, commands that can be used from Scapy. It's a pretty powerful set of tools here. I haven't scratched the surface hardly, but let me show you what I did do, um, which is over here. And like I said, this is really simple, so don't let me. <laughs> All right, so I've written this little uh, parser. I called it Sniffy. I've got a couple of files in here. This one has no TCP traffic in it at all, and that's a PCAP. And then I have this other PCAP here, which has quite a lot of PCAP traffic, or quite a lot of TCP traffic, sorry. Um, so if I just go like this, and run like that. It will tell me that it opened it, tell me that it didn't find any TCP traffic, and then it will, you can see, um, it will show that it created this sniffy output text and there's nothing in it. We can see that right here. If I cat that, it'll just print nothing at all. But if I run that same command again, this time with this larger packet, then it's going to open it and it's going to tell me that it wrote it to, to that file. And we see there's quite a bit of information in there now. Let me see if I can open that up in a way that's going to be easy to read. I think I've got... Here we go. And so what it's done here is it's it's I've I've had it label each packet by number and it shows Ethernet address, IP, destination source. It, it breaks it down in a pretty similar way to what the graphical the graphical one did. It just tells you every information that's there. Also, let me see if I can find a good example. Yeah, I got one coming up here. If it's available, it will also Give me the the raw data that was that was transferred, um, right? So so we can see if if the packet capture has has the data, then it will 
it will pull that out too and then and then show that to me um, anyway that's about it from this packet I can show you the actual code and just show you how easy how simple it is just plug through that real quick um, okay so I just import sys, I import logging, and the reason I do this is because it threw, it was throwing some uh, some kind of warnings at me that I didn't like, so I get rid of it. And then we just import scapey all. Uh, we, we, well, yeah, we import everything from scapey all. And then I check to make sure that, that they gave me a PCAP file to actually do anything with. And then here's like the little help section where if somebody does not use it, they can find that. And then I kind of just, this is where I just kind of print out, hey, this is what I'm doing. And this is where I open up the standard up to put in there. Here is basically the heart and soul of the thing, which is not much, not a whole lot of lines there. We just have for every packet in these packets that I assigned up here um, as, as that PCAP capture, go through and iterate by one and then just break it down and print out all the, the data that you have on it. And then down here's the main function where I just print out, hey, I did that. So that's about it. Cool. Does anybody have any questions? Good. No, I might, you know, I might look at some other aspects of this and then come back with some more information. I'd like to see what it looks like when, um, when we do pull apart some stuff that we'll get some of those graphical, those PNGs and, and PDFs and what some of that stuff looks like. So Yeah, I'd love to see more of a scaping sprinkle tool. Yeah, and like I said, like you saw, there was about, what, a dozen lines of code or something, and it yeah. parsed through that whole thing. I mean, and most of them were your print statement. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's clearly pretty powerful, and it did it really quick. You can see right there that that's a, that's a pretty big PCAP, you know, and it pulled it, pulled it apart pretty quick. We didn't really have to wait for it to do anything, so I like it. I will play with it some more, and that's all I got. All right. Thank you for sharing some stuff. All right. Go back to uh, screen sharing now for me. Okay. And then we're going to jump into my talk on uh, logging infrastructure with RSYSLog. So um, I'm not an RSYSLog expert or anything. Um, I just I helped design a um, the RSYSLog infrastructure at the NCSA, and we're just kind of give you a brief overview of what that is like and what it does, and in some examples of the configurations. So first, I'd like to talk about um, RSYSLog a little bit. So RSYSLog is a very powerful um, syslog daemon. And it's different from um, syslog-ng, which is also a powerful one from Bailabit. But one thing that I didn't, that's, um, I find a little bit problematic for the, the open source culture that I live in um, at the NCSA is that they actually, uh, to get a lot of the features um, that, uh, in our so syslog-ng, you have to pay for the commercial product. And they do have a, a nice syslog-ng daemon it, with the screen open source, but they have the commercial product as well, and that gives you the advanced features like um, reliable logging and such. But in the case of Arsys Law, those are all those are all free and open and uh, available to anyone. So I always choose that's that's probably my reason for choosing Arsys Law. That and they have RELF. RELF is a protocol that Rainer, the author of Arsys Law, helped develop or develop himself. Actually, I'm not really sure if he, how how people were involved with that, but it's the reliable event logging protocol. And it takes the idea of reliable uh, TCP connections as one layer on top that allows you to do things where, like in the case of TCP, where a connection is aborted and there's not tracked between, like if there's a last message sent or there's a bunch of outstanding messages that were not acknowledged, those are those are lost. Those are lost, and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. So, and this what uh, RELP was designed to actually help um, facilitate a way to to keep track of all those. So actually the receiver actually keeps a counter of everything and talks to the server um, of all the logs that it has and logs that it yet needs. So, so it's a better way to, to handle this particular point. If you need if you need uh, like really reliable logging like you do in say in the financial sector, uh, um, 
etc. So um, we actually in our in our organization, if you if you can if you can manage to install the RHEL uh, plugins, um, then in our syslog we, we recommend that, and then TCP, and then UDP in that particular order. And with uh, UDP, of course, it's a lossy protocol, and it relies upon the application to handle that loss. And in other particular cases, logs, if they do not make it to the destination, they are simply not reset. So it's always, it's, it's typically better if you're in, a, if you're in an environment where you can use TCP, you need to have better uh, quality of, of reliance on getting the logs to the destination to use that, or even further, again, to use RHEL if the system or the software you use actually supports it. And uh, our, our, our system has been redesigned, or it's actually made a, a long stride now, where it's actually not using the older format of um, simple statements with a with dollar sign prepended to them in the configuration file. Now it has a support for what's called Rainer script, and it's a scripting like, it has a scripting like feel to it where you can do like if and you can do conditionals and such. And then based on the condition, you can actually use an action and the action maybe to log to a file or send to a remote system or et cetera. So um, we'll, we'll be talking about our syslog and how we use it to do these things. And uh, to begin with, let's take a look at um, our, our infrastructure here. I have a diagram and it shows at the top. So in the top one of my parts of is redundancy. I want to focus on um, what happens at the central place down. Well, we have it designed in a way that here, the the cloud, all the all the clients, anywhere they're, wherever they are, wherever they are, on our network, on different networks, they forward to an IP address that is clustered using CARP, which is a protocol, common address redundancy protocol developed by the OpenBSD team, to allow you to uh, share a common IP address so that provides some sort of failover. And in this particular case, we uh, we use uh, PFSense routers. They have CARP enabled, so then what actually happens is they, the logs will get sent to either the load balancer one or the load balancer two, uh, depending on which one is up. And then what actually happens is those logs get forwarded to um, our two relay boxes, relay one and relay two. And from here, the relays, depending on which relay is up, so this is also adds another level of redundancy right here. So if relay two goes down, logs will then be or to really want because in PFSense we have it failed over, it actually checks to see if, it can, if the port is still open on that host, and then it will send it to the appropriate one. So uh, in that particular case, once it hits the relay, the logs are then forwarded to a storage system for retention, a, a indexer, in this case we use Splunk, and then also a, an analysis, uh, analysis machine, which in our case we're using OSSEC and SCC, the Assembly Event Correlator, and soon to be, we're going to integrate Sagan in there um, to actually have a multiple tools that are complementary to do analysis on our logs. So that's, that's, that's our architecture right now. And you can actually go to this website, um, links at the top, sigmas.net, I'll just go ahead and paste it in the chat, but this allows you to, you can actually see the article and uh, view the details of our current configuration. And we'll, I guess I'll move it off the screen. Oh, well, I'll just I'll paste in there later. Um, so, anyways, so let's go ahead and move to the boxes. So here I'm on I'm on a relay zero one, and this is the first relay. So after the logs hit our our load balancer system, they ended up at relay zero zero one if everything is working. That is, if relay zero two is not down, or if relay zero one is not down. And then, for, then from here, we have the RSS log configuration. What we have is we, using the Rainer syntax, the Rainer script stuff. Um, we have we use the new syntax that shows hey, you can load modules in this particular way. So we load the TCP module, the ICE, or the, the TCP mo or the UDP module, the TCP, and then the RHEL module, which is our event logging protocol. In this particular one, if you want to send RHEL, you actually need to load OM RHEL for output module RHEL. If you want to receive RHEL, then you will need to load the RHEL module for input module RHEL. That's and all. Huh? And RHEL was not enabled or even installed by default in, in a lot of the packaging systems for different distributions. So it actually brings up a good point. 
uh, that I need to touch upon is that uh, you, if you want to have these features, all the time you'll actually have to go out and compile it from source yourself, or maybe they have a package, uh, a PPA in the case of Ubuntu, maybe they're running their own repositories that you can pull from. And they do in, with the Red Hat systems and CentOS, you can actually use their repositories. And so you can Google it on their website. You can do the same thing with Ubuntu. So in most two cases, you just add theirs, and then you can actually install the additional modules. And then another one that's really nice is IMP status. And this is just a status module. It's basically on every queue that you have, our syslog will generate stats at a particular time. And here's every five minutes, or so 300 seconds right here. I'll write it out to the stats file so that I can then use other tools to graph the data and take a look at if we lost packets or we lost log messages or we can infer the amount that were queued, which ones are going to which queue. You can do all kinds of uh, analytic on that. And then and uh, what we do here with the module parameters is we can actually say for the particular module input rel, we can actually bind it to this particular port. And you cannot have rel and TCP on the same port, so be wary of that. That needs two separate sockets or two different services. So you'll have to use a different port, and 1514 is a common other one to use. Um, and then from there, we actually run down into the, the uh, rule sets. And in, in, in our syslog has this idea of rule sets, you can actually take and assign logs from a particular source to a rule set. And in this, any log that is attached to the remote rule set, it receives it, because it's the real, all it doesn't realize anything it actually receives, we actually forward it using this action right here to a particular system of power. So what we do here, we can forward it to our analysis system. It's just a name, it could be anything. And we give it the target IP address, the port to connect to it on, et cetera. And what we do is we end up using this queuing system. So all, uh, our syslog has the ability to, to provide queues. It can do uh, in-memory queues and disk-assisted queues. So it's important to do uh, disk-assisted queues, especially if you go to a protocol like RHEL. What actually happens is, if there's a case where the syslog, the R syslog even goes down on this on a particular client system, it needs to send logs. Well, from the example of SSH, you'll try to write a log when someone connects. And what actually happens if it goes down, you'll end up blocking that call. So it'll wait and wait. And eventually, after enough waiting a period, it will actually cause your system to become unres unresponsive. So, and this is a lock, it's just a bad case of lock. And so, a way to mitigate this is to uh, use disk uh, assisted queue. So, if, if the memory fills of logs that need to be sent, you at a certain threshold, in this case, one megabyte of memory, you actually write it out to a file. Yes, Jake. You know, stepping backwards in a second, did, did you say that you can't? You, you can't pass RELP and TCP traffic over the same port? Right. You're going to have to find a different one. Is it because RELP is, is using TCP protocol? Yeah, RELP is, that's exactly right. It is, it is a it is TCP underneath. Okay. So this adds a higher level of, uh, of uh, control over above that. So to, so to do this, um, to fix this particular case of lock of locking, uh, you would use this uh, space queue so that if the, the system ever go down, um, our, 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 our syslog ever fails or cannot send to the particular remote destination, then it'll write to a file. And uh, you can see that on shutdown, this, this one says, uh, go ahead and log to the, to the, the state of state of memory to the queue, to the distance to the queue, and then you can give it a file name. So any file labeled analysis-buffer is a disk assisted queue on the system if the system goes down. And then, of course, you can set the resume interval and the re retry account. To continuously retry until and send the log of the system comes back up. And otherwise, um, you back off for 30 minutes. So um, we do this for all our that we're saying to for the storage, the storage system, the analysis system, and the indexer. And then those machines will then do particular things with those logs. So let's take a look at. I have an example of the disk assisted queue here. So it's just a file. This is we had a, a Splunk system went down at one time, and we have this queue file here. So you can see that just it has to take a long line, open it, and you can just see it actually each each log in detail. So this is what it writes. It fills up the memory and the megabyte in our system. So we have configured that it will then write all the logs to the disk until it can until it can send them out. And you can see it's got the severity of the facility. Et cetera, and the actual log message and where it needs to go, where it came from, et cetera. So this is just a large file of logs that needed, needed to be sent at a particular point in time. And once the system comes, we'll resend them. So that's an example of that. From there, let's go to the analysis system. The analysis system is the one that we use that does the analysis of logs and runs the uh, signatures against them, you could 
say. In this particular case, a lot of it's set up the same way, except that here we have the rules. We're only, we of course, want to firewall this off to only allow this, uh, logs from the relay because their sole purpose is just to forward to these systems. And then what we want to do is we want to take those logs and do something with them. So there's a few ways to do it. Um, you can actually pipe it directly to the binary. So in this particular case, I have this comment that we're not doing at this point. But it will actually send it to the simple event correlator with these options in that way. If, if they match the condition. In this particular case, so this is how we're doing it now, we actually write it directly to disk into this directory called logs to analyze and put them in a file called all.log. And then anything that comes from the relays, which matches these two IP addresses, will then get put there. And then all actions are stopped after. So every time a log in, this, a log comes in, every single log comes in, this, this will be generated. And we can actually take a look at this. And let's see if I have, come on. Yeah, I don't have this. Go ahead. Here's all the logs coming in live right now. And what we can do is we can do a quick count, I suppose. Uh, so we time out. Oops, I can't tell you. One. All right. Now we'll do one minute, and then we'll do um, two. Log and we'll just do WCSL. This will give me the number of logs that came in for the minute. And when that's done, we'll see. We'll have a graph over there straight later. So this, what ends up happening is that this goes to this all.log file, which then all, uh, OSSEC, a host intrusion detection system and log analysis tool, actually read from and run the signatures on every log that comes in. And the same thing with this simple event correlator. It will also read from this file and then run its signatures or the process that we have we've built custom in house to actually go through those logs and analyze those as well. So from here, um, then we have the, the the final system. Well, if you don't count the index, we all know that what the index does. So we'll actually do quick queries um, after indexing it. So we're going to do look take a look at this, the uh, long term storage system and just show you what that looks like. So what we do here is we actually have the ability to do what are so called a template. So we to write your, your logs out in a certain format. And we actually have a template called by host. It uses strings and for the name in this particular case. So it's going to actually create logs for every host that it sees. It's going to be put into the year that it would receive, the month, the day, the host name, and then that data again in a nice format that is easily greppable using grep recursively or something like that. So you can just drill down on the month, the date, et cetera, how far you want to go. Um, in particular case, what it look, ends up looking like so it's February and let's look at Second, and you can see there's a, there's a lot of logs here. We can just do this. See how many there are. A lot of files here, actually. So these are all these are all individual files from a number of systems. So let's do it. Uh, yeah, so there's a number of systems sitting here, logs, each dated to the hour. And they all go in their appropriate files. So it's a way to nicely organize the logs, so providing using these templates that our syslog provides. Um, in this case, so that completed. In the last uh, minute, we actually had 14,000 messages come in. Which is nice, uh, not a big number because not, not, of course, everybody's off work now. There's not a whole lot going on. Um, so now let's move over to the, uh, the actual data section. Let's go back to this actually. So we're going to go back to take a look at uh, the IMP stats. That's something I wanted, I wanted to do IMP stats, and then. So this is that module I told you that writes out the stat every five minutes because we have it set that way. And you can let's go ahead and use ls dash s so we can scroll. There we go. And does it per queue? So we have the analysis queue. So every machine forwards to has a particular queue, and you can see how many logs were uh, sent to it, how many were dropped, et cetera, how many were processed. Here's from the core. So you can see this were many processes at this particular point in time. Then here. Again, cyclone that processed 169,000 at that particular interval, and just all this is in details. You can actually see it, and then of course they failed to make the queue, and if they were suspended, etc. It gives you all that information. And discarded is another one that's uh, important. You want to know when you lose logs, right? So in this particular case, there are all zeros at this point, which is good. So we want to see. What causes them to get discarded because they're empty, or 
And they get discarded because the queue gets full. Or like but in the case where uh, they get like drop packets. Yeah, it, yeah, it can be. But in the TCP case, it's not so much that. Uh, it's more like it, it's the cube become. Yeah, it's over the socket. The buffer socket is, is full. You know what I mean? It has to wait. It has to. Yeah. So that's essentially what it comes down to um, in that particular case. Um, then, last question. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to show you the, the uh, actual graphs that we're using. Um, so this is the relay system. Um, and we're going to first take a look at ETH traffic, the actual network interface. And you can see we're taking in this much and we're going out double or triple, which is the log that comes in to be sent out to each one of the machines with a separate network connection for each one and a separate log for each one of the connections. So we're sending to four, the three different machines at pretty good points, so that should be double or triple, and it looks like it matches up pretty well with the graphs. Then using the uh, actual IMP stats, we actually are parts to get the, the fields out of the column or the, the fields that we needed for every queue and you can see organized per queue the number of logs that actually were received so you can, can see how this can you blow it up a little bit oh yeah sorry blowing it up thanks so at this particular point you can see that um, these particular machines based on the queue receive this many logs you know just it changes varies wide day but you can see our high point is above 50,000 and we did some tasks using um, mouse baton our mouse tooth from the NetSniff Engine Toolkit and TrackGen. And uh, we were at, at the point of measurement, we had, a, we had an area where we could not measure because we couldn't get it more granular. But um, we did it was between 80,000, um, it was more than 80,000 logs. So um, per second, then we could do without any loss. But it could be up to a, a larger number, but I could not get the timing setting to go any lower. So it's not clear to me. Um, but we may have to do some further testing in the future. And then finally, this is the number of R log messages discarded by the queue. You can see we haven't lost anything. And then lastly, uh, this is the number of R log messages that were actually queued. And in this particular case, we actually had an issue with the load balancer going down, and some other systems went down, and there was a huge queue right here. But of course, those were then relinquished back to the appropriate host. So yeah, for a moment, while that system was down, we, we buffered 2.4. Thousand uh, logs, and then finally, um, with our with our so we have a Nagio system where I've written a, large, a number of plugins for RSS logs to monitor it, and uh, just you know checking the number of sockets that are on the machine and everything. We're not actually receiving all the logs from like supercomputer and stuff because there's like twenty seven thousand nodes, and. Uh, at this point, we're actually talking about if we, want to, if we want to receive them all and if we're capable of receiving, receiving them all, and that's a, that's a current ongoing discussion. But uh, right now, there's a, there's probably a, around 500 systems that we're receiving logs from, and there's a few that it's, I can't I don't I have to count them up, but um, that there are other relay of systems that people are sending them from, so the source address yeah source address is all the same. So there could be some more hidden behind there. So you're running this over NTSA, is that what you're saying? Yeah, this is running over NTSA. So like, how long do you keep these logs? Uh, there's a uh, few things. Uh, we actually keep them on the set logs for, I believe, two weeks. And then what is, ends up happening is that they're actually long term uh, rotated to a, a uh, AFS share and locked down from there. And that's, and I don't remember what the policy is on that, but it's much longer in case there's an incident and we need to refer back. Um, but that's, uh, that's essentially it. Yeah, because it seems like this would grow pretty fast. Huh? So this would uh, get expensive fast. Depends a lot on the log tape. As well. You mean the storage and all that? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're actually not doing a whole lot. There's some places that do tons, but we get about, I think it's, I don't know, about right, six gigs of logs a day. So. That's cute. Huh? <laughs> That's cute. What do you guys have? It? What do you guys have? <laughs> like, three or four hundred? Yeah, I figured it's a lot of it. Now, we could have, we, if we had the supercomputer stuff, it'd be a lot, but we, we don't have to do that right now. We have a lot. It depends on the log type for attention to, for example, like NetFlow data. There's so much of that, like, I think. During the semester that expires off in three or four weeks. Oh, does, are you counting your bro data in your in your NetFlow stuff? No. Okay. And so, so even with the bro data, that's a good example. We're not bringing in all of the the bro sources. Right. Yeah. So, because like you have some duplication, right? Because um, certain things to duplicate. So, like you have exit firewall logs, and you could also have session data in bro. 
So you have to decide where it makes sense to keep certain things or you could get it other places. Yeah, and, and see in our case, we're, these, the logs I'm showing you for these systems, it's only system logs. It's not uh, flow data or anything like that. Any questions? I think that wraps up my, my talk. It wasn't a very long one tonight. Um, so just trying to fill in because we didn't have a guest speaker slot. So um, if anybody has any questions, let me know. Um, unmute yourself. Or actually, I can probably just go ahead and see what happens. Feedback. 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 Some people might not want to be unmuted. Oh, fair enough. Wait. <laughs> Get the dog barking in their lap or something. So if there are any questions in chat, do post them. Um, I hope that I can help you. Yeah, I had that question earlier. I didn't want you were on a you were on a roll, and I was trying to do something at the same time, so I didn't want to interrupt you. But when that uh, that Christmas Carol contest thing, when was that? Is that an annual thing or? Yeah, it's, it's in December around Christmas time. Really? They sometimes do random ones as well, like like random. Who hosted it? And oh, really? That yes. was like fun. There's one out now. It's not fantastic. But... Yeah. It's pretty cool. Ones. Yeah, I have very I'm, topical I've too. Been, I've been meeting too, but I just haven't. I just haven't. Sounds like a Louis C.K. joke. It included everything. But hey, so again, if anybody wants has, does any of those challenges and wants us to talk about your results, we'd love to see them because uh, definitely see different interesting approaches to different problems. There's multiple ways to hand, to, to you know to find solutions for them. So you four them our way, and we'll talk about them. Um, so we do have a guest speaker for next week. We've got I got confirmed today for um, the guys from Facebook. Uh, they're going to be doing a, a, a presentation on OS query. So that's that's cool. And then for the 23rd, did you say sorry? The 24th, the 23rd, Google's uh, two guys from Google's Rapid uh, Response uh, Framework will be giving a talk as well at Open NSM. So you do want to look out for. So people from Facebook and then Google? Is that what yeah, you're yeah, so guys that work Facebook and, and Google. So, but, so that's yeah. nice to announce that. Hey, presenters. And of course, anybody wants to, to you know, again, uh, send us articles, things, I've been using the news. It's simply just, it's, just send me, forward me an email message if you think it's something interesting that I can talk about. You know, any challenges, any new tools, any academic research, any presentation, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to get it in here. And uh, this talk will be recorded and up on YouTube and Vimeo later. Uh, thank you. And that concludes the meeting if we don't have any questions. Okay. And do, do uh, feel free to tweet us at uh, hashtag OpenNSM. You can always use more, uh, more people, getting more people involved. So uh, thank you and take care. Do we, do we have a Twitter? <laughs>